Hi, my name is Marin and I'm a student at the Indigenous Community Legal Clinic, also known as the ICLC, located in downtown Vancouver. Today I'm going to be covering what human rights are protected from discrimination in British Columbia and what to do if you think you've been discriminated against. This video is part of the Live Law Project series on the British Columbia Human Rights Tribunal. This video was recorded on the unceded ancestral territory of the Musqueam, tsleil and Stolo nations. So let's start with the basic question. What is discrimination? Discrimination happens when you're treated differently than others and when this differential treatment causes you a negative effect. The BC Human Rights Code is the law that tells us what rights are protected from discrimination and in what areas of daily life they are protected. The code protects us from discrimination in five areas of daily life employment, housing, services, membership in unions and associations, and in publications. It's important to note that the code and the tribunal don't cover every situation where there might be discrimination. There's also something called the Canadian Human Rights Commission, and it covers issues that happen in federal jurisdiction. For example, if you're discriminated against on a reserve or in an airport, you would need to lodge a complaint to the Canadian Human Rights Commission instead of at the BC Human Rights Tribunal. This probably sounds confusing, because it is. At the end of this video, I will list some legal resources that can help you with your complaint and help you figure out where you want to lodge it. The BC Human Rights Code protects us from discrimination based on what are called protected characteristics. So different personal characteristics are protected depending on where you have experienced the discrimination. For example, a criminal conviction is a protected characteristic in employment, but not in tenancy. This means that someone can't refuse to hire you because of your criminal record, but a landlord can refuse to rent you an apartment if they find out about it. There are, however, several protected characteristics that show up in every category of daily life. These are race, color, ancestry, place of origin, marital status, family status, physical or mental disability, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, and age. If you are discriminated against for being Indigenous, you can make claims based on race, colour and ancestry. The law should recognise Indigeneity as a distinct protected characteristic, but it hasn't done so thus far. Alright, so now that we have an understanding of what rights are protected, let me provide some examples of discrimination that might be protected under the code. If you're injured at work and you need to take some time off for surgery, your employer fires you because of that temporary disability, that could be considered discrimination. Here's another example. A landlord might explicitly tell you that they will not rent you because you're Indigenous. Or they might refuse to rent an apartment to a couple with children and then rent it to a comparable couple without children the next day. But keep in mind, discrimination may not be as intentional or obvious as the examples I just mentioned. In fact, discrimination can sometimes come up when you're treated the same as everyone else but when you have a protected characteristic that needs accommodation. For example, if you're in a wheelchair and your building is only accessible by stairs, a landlord choosing not to build you a ramp could be considered discriminatory treatment. Here's another example. Say you work at a store that requires all staff to be available on Saturdays. If your religion prevents you from working on a Saturday, this employee-wide blanket treatment might actually be discrimination against you. So now let's talk about what happens if you think you've been discriminated against. You can file a human rights complaint at the BC Human Rights Tribunal, also called the HRT. The HRT is like court, but it's specifically for human rights issues. You have one year from when you think you've been discriminated against to file a complaint at the BC HRT. When you file your complaint, you become the complainant. The person you're accusing of discrimination becomes the respondent. Sometimes the respondent will be another person, but it also could be a corporation. If you think a corporation might be involved in your issue, you should always name the corporation using their proper legal name on your application. 
Now, I'll provide an overview of the HRT process and the potential decision points along the way. If you need more information on filling out the complaint form, please watch our video, How to Fill Out the Human Rights Tribunal Complaint Form 1.1 in the Live Law Project's Human Rights series. So as the complainant, you need to show facts that prove discrimination. This involves proving three main factors. First, you need to demonstrate that you have a personal characteristic that the BC Human Rights Code protects from discrimination. Say, for example, if you're an Indigenous person and you're treated differently because of your indigeneity, you would make your complaint on the basis of race, color, and or ancestry. Second, you have to show that the respondent's behavior has affected you negatively in one of the protected areas of daily life. For example, if you were fired from your job because your employer found out that you were pregnant, the negative outcome would be the loss of your job. Third, you need to demonstrate that your protected characteristic was a factor in how you were treated, as well as a factor in the negative outcome. This is what's called proving the nexus between the respondent's actions or lack of action, the negative outcome, and your personal characteristic. Keep in mind your personal characteristic doesn't need to be the only or even the most important factor in the treatment that you experience. It only needs to be as little as 1% of the reason that the respondent acted the way they did. You also don't need to show that the respondent intended to discriminate against you. If you can demonstrate the three factors I just mentioned, you have what's called a prima facie case of discrimination. Despite the fact that you may have proved this prima facie case, this does not mean that the HRT will automatically judge in your favor. The respondent can also raise defenses that may justify their behavior in some situations. So to defend themselves, the respondent would need to show three things. First, they need to show that they acted for a legitimate reason. This means the respondent's action would have needed to have a purpose beyond the discrimination. Second, the respondent needs to demonstrate that they acted honestly and did not intend to be discriminatory. And third, the respondent must show that they took reasonable steps to avoid the negative effect on you. These reasonable steps are called the duty to accommodate. While the duty to accommodate looks different depending on the protected characteristic, the basic requirement is that the respondent has a duty to accommodate your personal characteristic up to the point that they experience undue hardship. This means that a respondent, whether they're an employer, a landlord, or a service provider, does have a responsibility to take on some hardship to meet this duty, but only to the extent that the HRT finds reasonable in the circumstances. For example, if you lose your hearing, it may not be unreasonable for your employer to find you an interpreter instead of terminating your employment. However, it might be considered unreasonable to ask all employees to learn sign language to accommodate you. It really depends on the facts of your case. So this might be a good time to talk about what happens when you file your complaint. There are several steps in the process, but I'll highlight the main events and decision points along the way. It's important to note that you do not need legal representation to apply to the HRT. The process is long and confusing, so sometimes getting legal help is a good idea. So first, your complaint is going to be screened to see if it meets the basic requirements for a successful HRT complaint. The HRT will then let you know if your complaint has been accepted. Please note that having your claim accepted by the HRT does not indicate that you'll be successful in a tribunal hearing. It just means your claim has met the minimum requirements to enter the process. Second, if you and the respondent have indicated that you're open to early settlement, your case will go to what is called a settlement mediation. This meeting is facilitated by a neutral third party assigned by the HRT. It gives parties a chance to decide on an outcome that meets both their needs without having the complaint proceed to a hearing. Usually, a settlement involves compromise from both sides of the dispute. If the complaint is settled, the complainant withdraws their complaint. If you cannot settle, your complaint continues to the next step of the process. That brings us to the third step. This is where the respondent is given the opportunity to respond to your complaint and raise their defenses. They also have the opportunity to apply to have the complaint dismissed. That would remove your complaint entirely from the HRT process. However, if the respondent doesn't apply to have it dismissed, or if the HRT rejects their application, your complaint continues to the next step in the process. So fourth, there may be a case conference between yourself and the respondent and an option for further mediation. 
Again, the parties have an opportunity to try and settle their complaint outside of a hearing. One of the reasons there is such a focus on settlement between parties before a hearing is that the parties have much more freedom to control the outcome. While the HRT is limited in the remedies they can assign, the parties have much more freedom to settle on anything they feel is fair, from basic remedies like money to more creative ones like the respondent taking sensitivity training. But settlement agreements could even be things like having the respondent mow your lawn for a year, or the respondent maybe needs to write you a song. Lastly, if mediation fails, the final decision point happens at an HRT hearing. This is where the tribunal will decide if the complainant has proved that the respondent discriminated against them. The tribunal will hear evidence from yourself and the respondent, and they will make a legally binding decision. At this point, the HRT can provide you with a remedy. This might require the respondent to pay you financial compensation. The tribunal can also issue an alternative flexible remedy. An example of a flexible remedy could be requiring the respondent to issue you an apology or requiring that they take some type of sensitivity training. All right, so in summary, this video has discussed what discrimination is, what to do if you think you've been discriminated against, and what is required for a successful HRT complaint. We've also provided you with a brief overview of what the BC Human Rights Tribunal process looks like. At this point, I can imagine you might feel quite overwhelmed or like you don't know where to start. The good news is that there is help you can access if you need it. If you are Indigenous and in need of assistance with assessing the merits of your complaint, filing a complaint, or if you require representation for an HRT hearing, please contact the Indigenous Community Legal Clinic. You can reach the clinic intake line by phone at 604-822-1311 or you can visit them at their office in Gastown on 148 Alexander Street. They're open Mondays and Wednesdays from 10 until 3. UBC's Law Students Legal Advice Program also provides free assistance with human rights complaints for individuals who have a low income. You can reach them by calling 604-822-1311 5791. They're open Monday to Friday from 10 a.m. till 4 p.m. If you have already filed an HRT complaint that looks like it has all the necessary requirements and you're unable to find assistance from any other sources, you may be eligible for help from the Human Rights Clinic at the Community Legal Assistance Society. You can find more information on their website or by calling 604-622-1100. Thank you for watching. All Live Law Project content is provided by law students for informational purposes only. It is not and should not be considered legal advice. We're not suggesting that you make legal decisions based on any content included as part of this project without seeking legal or other professional advice. We cannot guarantee the accuracy of our content. The information in this project may not apply to you if you don't live in British Columbia or if the law has changed.